Hi guys and welcome back to another video from the Aspiring Medics. In this video we're going to be going through a mock Oxbridge tutorial and interview and basically interviews are mock tutorials or supervisions. We're going to be going through it and you're going to see the to and fro and how it's really much a conversation as well. So if you guys are new here do not forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe. It's the best way of staying up to date to help you guys get into medical school. So without further ado, let's get into it. Just welcome to this Aspiring Medics Oxbridge mock interview. I'm joined by William. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, nice to see you Yusuf. My name's Will and I'm starting medicine at Oxford this year. So Will, I'd like you to first start off with actually got a graph for you that I do want you to have a look at and I want you just to talk to me about what you think this graph shows. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean it looks quite self-explanatory. It's a, it's a graph that shows the different rates of breast cancer in different uh, regions around the world. So we can see that in Australia and New Zealand they have the highest. Uh, they have, let's see, uh, around about 95 uh, women per 100,000 with breast cancer. Okay, and how does that vary across different countries? Yeah, so it varies quite considerably looking at it. The lowest rate is in South Central Asia where only 25 in every 100,000 women uh, have breast cancer. So that's quite a big difference. Um, and looking at it just off the top of my head, those countries with the highest rates of breast cancer seem to be the more developed countries. Mm. Okay, so why do you think that there is this massive difference? I mean, we're talking like a fourfold difference in terms of rate. So what do you think could be behind that? Yeah, um, well, obviously, there's people have different lifestyles in these different regions. And so they'll be exposed to risk to risk factors for breast cancer differently. So uh, it might be that there's a greater, for example, a greater rate of smoking or poorer diets in these um, more wealthy countries. What else could it be? Uh, it could also be actually that in places like Australia and New Zealand, they might have a life expectancy that, say, double what it is in uh, South Central Asia. So it might not be that they're more likely to get breast cancer sort of per year of their life, but just because they live for double the length of time, they might be twice as likely to get it at some point. Um, that could be a, a factor. Also, I suppose different countries and different areas will have different testing uh, and different screening programs. So it could well be that there are much more screening programs in somewhere like New Zealand. So they're detecting more breast cancer, even though the rate could be the same in Western Africa, but it's not being detected as much. Yeah, good. So how can incidents be calculated? How do you think these stats were first gone in the first place? How were they calculated? I think presumably, well, you'd have to test women across all age groups uh, to make sure it's representative. Um, there'd be probably screening programs. So they for example, they might screen a thousand women. Um, and then, for example, if uh, 10 women out of those thousand had breast cancer, then they would times it up to work out the rate um, per number of women in that population. But they'd also presumably do it in all different parts of that country or region as well to make sure it's representative. Yeah, absolutely. And it's quite ambiguous, isn't it? What you mean by um, all ages as well. Is that then covered then for each average age, as you say, or is it something that's done, you know, for the average, you know, 30 year old, for example? So that varies quite considerably. So whether it's been actually adjusted for the mean age of an individual is actually quite important in the circumstance as well. And as you say, in terms of screening, that can vary quite a lot, couldn't it? As you say, what, what could screen be limited by? I mean, it would be limited by the healthcare system in these different places and the resources and money that are allocated to that. So, yeah, I mean, basically, it would just be down to the fact that in places like Western Europe, where we have well-funded healthcare systems, they can afford to spend that money uh, screening for breast cancer, whereas probably in somewhere like uh, in, in some of the poorer parts of Africa, they've got mm. so little funding available that it's much more cost effective to use that on treating uh, the more common diseases that, that they know that people have rather than trying to find people with breast cancer. Great. And you've mentioned in terms of actual factors as to why that also difference could arise if it was a true difference. You've mentioned in terms of environment, you've mentioned in terms of smoking and lifestyle. What about behaviour? What comes into mind for behaviour? Well, by that, would you include things like diet or...? Yeah, there is crossover there, isn't there? What else yeah. could be involved? Um, 
I suppose exercise, exercise would have some factor. So, um, yeah, maybe in maybe in these more wealthy countries, we have more sedentary lifestyles than than in places like Africa. So yeah. in that sense, the sedentary behavior is obviously possibly going to lead to more obesity and uh, things like that, which could increase the risk factor for cancer. Actually, thinking about breast cancer, it might be that in these poorer places, uh, women might be having far more children. And so they're having to do more breastfeeding. Uh, that's a behavior in a sense. And that might actually increase. I'm not sure, but that, that might be something that increases the risk of breast cancer as well. Yeah, so it's an interesting hypothesis. And now you're thinking in terms of um, the amount of children that potentially that um, each woman could have, for example, and the effect mm. that, that could therefore have on them in, in terms of having like an interrupted period, obviously, during pregnancy, not having a period as well. And the hormonal change and then how that could potentially affect cancer. Yeah, really good. Awesome. OK, we'll leave that one there for now. And okay. just think more globally in terms of screening. We've touched on this as well. Um, why does the NHS spend so many millions of pounds each year on cancer screening and what's the purpose of it? Screening, the purpose of screening is to uh, detect small tumours, I think, that you can't detect uh, by by actually seeing them or feeling them. So the purpose of that is to um, to detect cancer in its early stages so that then you can treat, uh, you can treat people with cancer and they'll be uh, I mean, perhaps you might need to use less vigorous treatments, whereas if you waited until uh, a tumour was large enough to be felt, then you might need to use, you know, much more expensive and much more demanding uh, treatments. OK, so you've mentioned cost in yeah. terms of how it from a sort of utilitarian argument, it sort of saves money. What else comes to mind? Um, well, if you're treating a cancer in its early stages, there'd probably be much more disruption to the lives of the of the, of those women because they're not probably having to do as much chemo or something yeah that's that's about all i can think of to be honest okay and have you heard of something it's funny if you haven't have you heard of something called prognosis i have heard of it i wouldn't be able to define it for you so if i if i define it and now i define it as being the likely outcome of a disease you've mentioned in terms of cost how something at a later stage is obviously going to um, then be more expensive that might mean there'd be more rounds of chemotherapy for example mm. what's also an obvious benefit as well of catching oh. something else. yeah well of course if you if you catch it at its earlier stages then you can manage it and uh, probably greatly increase the sort of the life expectancy if you like of that cancer sufferer so because yeah i mean a smaller tumor would do less damage so yeah if you catch it early with a screening program then you can probably treat it and manage yeah. it very well so they've got a better prognosis say of a probably a, a longer and higher quality uh, life as an outcome of that. Yeah, absolutely. And now thinking about it in terms of, well, by the sounds of it then, screening is fantastic. So why don't we screen for everything? Why don't we just spend more and more money screening? Like, where where is the end to this? Why don't we do it for everything? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I suppose in an ideal world, it would be good to screen for, for lots of things, uh, but for every age group, because, yeah, I mean, as we said, it was it would probably increase the prog it would improve the prognosis of people who were found to have uh, cancer. But obviously, there's a there's a there's a high cost to these screening programs. So the NHS has to think about where is the most effective place to spend its money, and it's presumably more cost effective to spend money actually treating patients with diseases rather than spending millions on. Uh, trying to detect other diseases when often there'll be quite probably there'll be quite low rates of these diseases like certain cancers so it wouldn't be uh, cost effective to screen for all of them also I think they probably focus on just the specific age groups of people who are most likely to have the cancer so I think for breast cancer they screen for sort of 50 year olds and over 50 year olds um, because as much yeah. as it would be to screen everyone you're much more likely to get cancer once you uh, breast cancer once you pass 50. Unfortunately, it's just a case of limited resources, I think. OK, so you've mentioned the resource argument. Is there anything else to think about? Something's come to mind. It, it might be wrong, but also screening uses sort of X-rays and scanners and so on. So actually, if you were to screen lots of people over and over for stuff, I know that X-rays or certain radiation can increase the risk of cancer. So that it might only be minutely, but you could actually be increasing someone's risk of cancer by 
screening them 10 times for all different types. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're thinking about the iatrogenic harm, the actual harm in actually scanning someone, say using an x-ray and the harm that that could do and paradoxically how that increases their risk, say, of cancer. Absolutely. What about in terms of sensitivity and specificity? I mean, there are only certain things that you can screen for probably. So um, I'm not sure, but maybe certain types of cancer like uh, leukemia or uh, cancer of the bone you might not actually be able to detect through screening so that might be what you mean by specificity but I'm not really sure to be honest yeah so if I say if we start off with one like sensitivity sensitivity is all about how well something can pick up I uh, say a test how sensitive a test is we got like COVID like a COVID LFT lateral flow test are infamously not as sensitive as we'd want them to be the reason yes. being that they're not sensitive is because they're not picking up on the positive cases that you want them to pick up on. So there's yeah. loads of false negatives. It's telling you no, when really it's a yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So have a think just about sensitivity and how that could relate to screening. Okay. So uh, it might be that certain cancers aren't more commonly screened for because um, because the screening methods aren't particularly sensitive. So it might be that they wouldn't uh, necessarily detect uh, tumours when they are there, uh, perhaps because they're in sort of an inaccessible place or I'm not sure what the other reasons would be, but that could be why certain cancers like breast cancer might be, uh, you know, the screening methods for that might be more sensitive. So they're uh, less likely to miss a tumour, um, sort of give a false negative, if you like. Great. And what about it in terms of, if I then talk about specificity, and if I say that you don't want to have a load of false alarms, why do you not want to have a lot of false alarms in this NHS screening programme, say for cancer? Yeah, OK. So I'd imagine that for every uh, positive case that comes out of the screening programme, that that person would then need to go and have follow ups and maybe further blood tests or scans, yep. which would be really disruptive for them and possibly possibly quite damaging for their mental health if they think they have cancer and actually they don't of course it would cost more for the nhs as well what would cost more um having to having to use up more more staff more time more resources to uh to do these follow-ups and possibly even if well i don't think they start treatment until they were certain of it but yeah they'd have to do uh further tests and uh to make sure that they had cancer which would involve nurses and doctors and different teams using their time up on that, which would cost more. On a similar line to that, why don't we just do breast screening then for those un aged under the age of 50? I think, like I said earlier, you're most likely to uh, to get breast cancer sort of from the age of 50 onwards. And so given that there's limited resources, as, as has come up so often in this discussion, I think that the NHS is, well, I think that the people in charge of that have just decided that it's best to focus on the women who are most likely to have breast cancer and screen in that age group. Great, excellent. Okay then, what about a medical reason as to why it might be more difficult to screen those under the age of 50? If you think about it in terms of the fact that a mammogram is going to be looking at the density of breast tissue, any thoughts? Yeah, so I mean young young girls and young women, often, often their breasts won't be fully formed, particularly if they haven't gone through puberty yet. So uh, I'd imagine that if you're screening for breast cancer in those young age groups, yeah, you, you might be less likely to pick it up because, yeah, like I say, the breasts aren't fully formed. That could be a reason. Yeah, good point. And what about after age 18? What about between 18 and 50 then? To be honest, I'm not sure. Um, could it be something to do with um, having children around that age or how the breasts change in that time? Interesting thought. So if you think about it in terms of a mammogram, which is going to have a look at a difference in density in breast tissue, what happens um, with most things actually past age of 50 is that things begin to atrophy and it becomes less dense. So in those older uh, than 50, their um, breast tissue becomes more sparse effectively. And that yes. means it becomes easier to visualize a, a, a lesion, say a cancer, for example, that might grow, which is gonna be a lot denser. So okay. with that in mind, 
have a think then between aged 18 to 50, why it might be more difficult to um, do a mammogram? Well, because the tissues would be more dense uh, with ladies in that age group, then with this mammogram, there'd be less of a difference in density between the uh, cancerous tissue and the breast tissue. So you'd be less likely to be able to distinguish the two and see that they have cancer. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really good there. And my last question, we're really talking about resource allocation here, is switching the tax a bit. If you were given a billion pounds to spend on the NHS, so you're the new health secretary, um, as you know, there's been about four different ones in the last two years. So you're the new health secretary now, you're the newest one. What are you going to be spending a billion pounds on? That's a good question. Um, I will give you a proper answer, but I would just say that if I was put in charge of the health uh, system and I was given that money, First, the first thing I do is have is do some sort of study into where is the most cost cost effective place to put that money because I because you know because frankly I don't know that yet I doubt many people do uh, so that would be the first thing I would do but um, just thinking about yeah I'll give you a proper answer um, some of the things that come to mind would be I think I'd spend more money on preventative medicine so trying to keep people out of hospitals in the first place um an example of that would be on awareness campaigns for example about diet or sleep i think that if if we could just improve these things then far far fewer people would be going to hospital through diseases related to poor diet obesity or sleep deprivation and therefore we wouldn't need to necessarily increase the resources of the nhs because there'd be fewer patients per healthcare worker so their patient outcomes would hopefully improve as well um so yeah i think that would be probably where i'd put some of the money um sleep actually i did an epq on sleep so i think that sleep is really important and frankly i don't think it gets enough attention uh in, in our society uh for example i know that if you don't sleep after getting a vaccine uh according to one study you have half the number of antibodies uh, against that particular antigen four weeks later compared to if you had slept. So if you just think about that in you know in relation to the COVID vaccines, how effective would that be if everyone was just told to get a good night's sleep the night afterwards? Uh, and I think there's lots of areas around lifestyle where that could be applied. Absolutely great answer, lovely. Okay, so we're going to change uh, tack a bit again and we're going to be thinking now about medical ethics. You're working now in ICU, okay? and you have one donated kidney available, but you have three patients that need it. Mm -hmm. One is a 60 year old teacher with five days to live if he doesn't receive the transplant. So that's yeah. one. You've got another that's a drug addict in his thirties who has kidney failure due to drug usage and will die within two weeks without the transplant. And mm -hmm. lastly, there is an 18 month old pregnant woman with cancer in her kidneys whose baby will survive but she won't live much past its birth without the kidney transplant. So who would you give that kidney to? Yeah, that's a tricky one. First of all, can I establish that there's a chance that other kidneys might become available later down the line? So it's not, is it, is it guaranteed that the other ones will die or not necessarily? Let's just view it in terms of this one kidney that's available. That's all we know. There might be another one that comes available, but we don't know. That's an uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. okay. Can deal with at the moment so what's your action plan well, well the first thing i say is that i would not uh discount the drug addict um from getting it because we don't know what what his situation is um you know they might have had uh, some sort of mental health crisis that caused them to take that overdose so um it would be important to uh, to find out more about that but not to not to rule them out uh on the grounds that it's that perhaps the reason that there is self-inflicted because, uh, yeah, like I say, we don't know what's going on there. As for the pregnant mother, um, obviously it's really important that uh, that a child uh, is raised by its mother. So it, obviously it would be it would be terrible if uh, if if the baby wasn't raised by by its mother. I think actually thinking about the 60 year old teacher with modern medicine, he could live uh, easily another 30 years, say, uh, of an excellent quality of life. So again, I wouldn't rule him out just because he's older than the others. I think, did you say that the teacher has the, has the least time to live? Yeah, so the teacher's got five days to live. The yeah. Two weeks and the pregnant mother's effectively got one month. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I think then if I had to make a decision, I'd give it to the teacher 
just because he has the fewest days to live so he needs it most urgently yeah and then hopefully maybe another i mean that would maximize the chance that another kidney would become available um later down the line for one of the other two patients okay so you did it based on urgency basically pretty much yeah okay absolutely fine yeah it makes sense and you might have heard this before but in what ways, in fact, what's the only way that doctors discriminate between patients? And I just say discriminate in inverted marks. What's the only way that doctors differentiate between patients? No, I did read something about this, but I'm afraid it's like, it slipped my mind a bit. It's something about the, it, it's a combination of the quality and the quantity of life that they have remaining, I think. Yeah, so the, the thing all about is clinical need that we're thinking about there is clinical need. Um, and I think what you're maybe thinking about is in terms of quality of life and how long they live as well. So mm. that's called quality adjusted life years. Oh, that was it. OK, you've thought about it in terms of urgency, but what mm. else can you think about? What are the other factors that's going to help you make your decision? What other components would you want to consider? Well, it could be that so they might have other things wrong with them, basically. So it might be that actually, for example, the teacher had several organs that were failing. so they have greater clinical needs and they would need many, many more uh, operations or transplants or whatever in order to recover. So that would uh, possibly make it less advantageous to give the kidney to them. It could also be that, I'm trying to think what other reasons there could be. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to uh, make sure that the kidney isn't rejected by any of them. Otherwise it would be useless, but I don't think uh, that comes into your question. How would you make sure that it's not rejected? I'm not entirely sure, but I believe how they do it is they uh, they they give uh, immunosuppressant drugs uh, after after the kidney's been transplanted in to prevent the immune system from uh, attacking the foreign cells. Yeah, correct. So you've got that aspect. And what else do they do in terms of matching? I don't know. Okay, that's fine. You might have heard of something called tissue type matching, kind of like blood groups, but they also match up the tissue type to make sure you've again not got that chance of having these antigens that are going to reject it and therefore have an immune response. So yeah. absolutely thinking about the tissue type is going to be quite important. You yeah. also mentioned having other diseases that might increase your clinical need, but it can also then mean that you're you might not get as much out of your kidney because that might not mean that you can then get back to a certain stage. So in terms of quality adjusted life years, really yeah. good. Um, what else can you think about? What's going to happen to the other patients? Are they? Are you just going to discharge them, get them out? No, no. OK, so you'd want to see if there are any other possible treatments for any of the patients. So if there's any alternative to the transplant. Yeah. OK, and we we're speaking about kidney transplant, aren't we? Yes. What does the kidney do? Um, the kidney effectively uh, filters the blood. It filters. Good. And is there something that you might have covered in A-level biology about some sort of machine that can help to filter blood? In yes. Those um, yeah, we haven't covered it in biology, but I, no. I'm aware that you can that you can be a I don't know the name of the machine, I'm afraid, but effectively an artificial kidney. So you can be hooked up and it will filter your blood for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's called dialysis. That's the one. Yeah. So how could that come into play here? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it might be that one of those three might have uh, some sort of it might be that their kidney is still functioning, but just not particularly well. So one possible treatment could just be uh, having regular dialysis and they could go on with that same kidney and that would then eliminate the need for a transplant um, or even if the even if the kidney is not working at all, um, they could be put on dialysis until a new kidney was found and was available. So dialysis could definitely uh, could yeah that could prolong their life. Okay, good. And if we're thinking about it, my last question with this scenario is: if we're thinking about it in the circumstance of that pregnant uh, woman, for example, if the kidney isn't filtering, well, what is the kidney filtering? Firstly, what can it filter? Um, well, it's it filters out all sorts of small molecules so urea is one thing that's filtered out and not reabsorbed um, yeah. other other waste products as well i think good so urea and other waste products why do they need to be filtered out um well i mean they're waste products so you don't want them uh, building up in the blood um, why i uh, i think they're toxic so they would just do damage to cells and i suppose following on from that with a pregnant woman the last thing you'd want is a build up of toxic waste products in the blood to then 
uh, diffuse across the placenta into the baby's bloodstream that could harm the baby. Absolutely, absolutely. And on the flip side of that, though, for the pregnant woman, it's quite high risk to do any sort of surgery as well, isn't it? Um, particularly if you are going to be doing it in the abdomen, which is quite close to where baby could be as well. And if they're eight months in, could it be worth then leaving it until after the baby's born? So thinking about all of those aspects as well, I uh, would have to be taken into account. But that's really good. That's really good. I'm going to give you a short break and I'm going to go straight in to the next graph for you. So have a think about this. I'll give you a minute. OK, so what is this graph showing? So it shows um, it shows the number of people out of 100,000 initially that survive across the 100 year time span after their birth so effectively it shows the life expectancy of people born in those years so each line uh is for a group of people who were born in different years so you can see the blue line is people born in 1900 to 1902 yellow line is for uh 1949 to 1951 and then the red line is the most recent is people born in 2009 what is it actually showing in terms of the differences in the graphs in the actual lines yeah so the overall trend here is that uh, the later the groups were born uh, the better their life expectancy because the fewer of them uh, well the more survives longer so you can see that the greatest difference is between those born in 1900 and in 1950 um, you can see that actually uh, the line drops quite steeply down right at the start so there's lots of deaths uh, during childhood and for young people, whereas that that reduces enormously uh, to 1950. And again, very, very few people seem to die in those young groups in uh, who were born in 2009. It doesn't look like the the maximum life, if you like, um, where the line meets the X axis. It doesn't look like that actually changes all that much. Um, yeah. And clearly there was the greatest progression in life expectancy between 1900 and 1950 as opposed to between 1950 and 2009 because there's yeah. a great difference between those lines yeah good good and for the first few years especially for those born in say 1900s you've got mm. quite a massive decline especially at the start that actually isn't reciprocated in the other graphs so what what could be the reason for that so to be clear it's this part here that we're looking at what could be the reason as to why this part here? yeah yeah well in 1900 there'd have been um well healthcare was much much less advanced than it is now so um i don't know the exact dates of things but there might not have been any uh, antibiotics or they might not have had effective antibiotics for any common uh, diseases in in babies so there's yeah um, it's more likely that if a, if a baby or a young person was to catch something then they would die from it Whereas in these later years, we have lots more treatments available, so it's much less likely. Good. So you've mentioned antibiotics, you've mentioned healthcare provision as well. Anything else that could be responsible for the improvements in lifespan, particularly in terms of improving the survival rate in younger years, you know, between uh, zero to 15 here? Well, one thing, I'm not sure it's the, it's the main reason, but it could also be partly due to uh, the way that pregnant women are uh, treated and how their pregnancy is managed. So... Um, perhaps in in the 1900s and 1950, they would uh, they wouldn't have been as informed about uh, the effects of diet and exercise and alcohol on the um, developing fetus. So yeah. maybe actually in 1900, um, the uh, the pregnant woman would have drunk more, and that would have had a negative impact on the baby. So it's more likely to more likely to die in its younger years. Good and. You're thinking really good. So you're thinking again in terms of healthcare. Stepping away from healthcare, what else could be responsible for improvements in the survival rate between zero to 15, especially between 1900 to 1949? Um, well, just in, I, I think just in general, the environment for these children is, uh, is, has improved massively. So, um, for example, these days, obviously children go to preschool and school and it's uh, it's a very safe environment, and there's no no hazards or things that are likely to to cause death. Whereas in the 1900s, the conditions I think were much harsher. So yeah, children weren't protected as much. I'm not sure if that's the answer you're looking for, but it was just there's there are more things that are likely to 
unfortunately kill you i think at a young age back in 1900 yeah absolutely so you're thinking in terms of improvements in terms of school in terms of sort of children not having to work say you know yeah sort of victorian times sort of before that as well okay fine anything else that comes to mind particularly in terms of living conditions and how that could affect it and how living conditions could be associated to health yeah um well, there's been certain progressions, like just to name an example, maybe how sewage is managed. So I don't know when it was. I didn't do history, unfortunately, but I know that back in the day they they didn't have proper sewers. So, you know, feces and excrement and stuff was just thrown into the street or whatever. And clearly that creates a very unhygienic uh, environment. And there's probably lots of cases where actually things were less hygienic back in 1900s. Therefore, you'd be more likely to um, to catch to catch diseases off or to contract diseases off um things like that absolutely and within that actually let's have a think therefore about um different other ways what about housing how could housing affect things the quality of housing would have been worse back in the day so one thing might be that for example it, it would be very cold in the winter they won't have had good insulation that might mean that children would be more likely to maybe suffer from hypothermia i'm not sure but there'd be more illnesses associated with that children would probably more likely have slept in rooms together in those older years but i'm not sure i can't think of any reason why that would necessarily increase the the death rates how could that so you're you're absolutely spot on there how could that how could overcrowded uh, housing conditions, living conditions, then impact health. It might be that they are sharing beds or sharing clothes. So bacteria is, is transferred between them more easily. And also if one person gets some sort of illness, yeah, it's it's much more likely that the rest of them will, will also get that illness and possibly die from that. Absolutely. So exactly that. So you're thinking in terms of infection, right? Being overcrowded, more likely to have um, infection risks as well associated. Yeah with that really good there's something a bit confusing about this graph to me so this all makes sense but you've got this red line here that shows those born in 2009 yeah how is this how is this data you know actually come about because i don't know many 90 year olds or 100 year olds born in 2009 so how did that come about that's a good point um so i reckon that what they've done here is um they've just basically used their best estimate using the data they have available so obviously if you were born in 2009 you'd be what 13 at the moment so they have up to the age of 13. i suppose that they have data of i mean they'll have these lines for people born in the past and they'll be able to see how that's changing over time with as lifestyles change so presumably it's um they've basically extrapolated that if you like um onto those born in 2009 assuming that the trends that have affected life expectancy in the past will continue. Yes, absolutely. They've absolutely have had to done uh, some sort of extrapolation, sort of carrying forwards data. But can you zoom into that a bit for me? Like, what do you mean in terms of following the trends and how would they have done that? They'd have looked at individual things like, well, they'd have seen how the number of people reaching the age of, say, 90 has changed in the last, you know, per say, per five years for the last hundred years. So they'd have seen that maybe for every five years, the number of people reaching 90 has increased by 1%. So they've carried that over. So, OK, good. So one hypothesis could be they're sort of estimating it and be like, well, hang on, there's you know, been a 4% increase in lifespan. So, you know, it'll be about that. That's one way. That's quite an eyeball-y way. And that's not really scientific, is it? And so you're just guesstimating it that way. What's another way of doing it? They know how, how drastically lifestyles have changed. So they know... For example, looking at air pollution, they know how that's changed and how that's likely to change in the future. Obviously, it can't be entirely accurate because we don't know what's yeah. going to happen in the future. So, it, yeah, it, it probably really depends on several environmental factors. With the example of air pollution, they've probably um, looked, at, looked at how it's changed, assumed a certain trend based on the current evidence and then interpreted that as to how that would affect life expectancy. And But what evidence did they use? As in, they'd have used the existing evidence of air pollution, how it's changed up till now. I assume that they'll look at, for example, how how the number of um, internal combustion engine cars is likely to decrease. And they'll, yeah, actually, that would be quite difficult to do, wouldn't it? <laughs> so based on air pollution, to then work out what the resultant death rates could be. I like your style. Okay, that's quite interesting. What could be a... 
a somewhat simpler way of doing it. If, for example, you said had different death rates that you knew, different death rates for all the different causes of death, say. Yeah. How could you then use that to help guide you? Well, you could see how the uh, how the how the rate of death from different causes has changed over time in the past. And you can see the current death rates from various different things. And they might just assume that, that the death rates won't change much and just carry that over. Or they might uh, try and continue the trend. For example, maybe the death rates from uh, AIDS is decreasing at a steady rate. So they would, like I said earlier, it, it extrapolate that trend and reduce the, the death rate. Also, actually, because for this graph, it, it's death rates at each different age, they'd look at the death rates for people at different age groups and and they see from that how how many people die in each different age bracket yeah and you're absolutely right so they could do it in terms of each different age bracket they could do it say for example every five years you know what are the common causes of death having a look at the death rate potentially from there uh, looking at the trends in that looking at the modern um, aspects of that and then um calculating it accordingly basically doing you know working out the death rate for each and all so different age and then doing it accordingly in terms of the causes of the death absolutely but why is it so smooth surely you'd imagine there to be different points how is it so smooth the lines in the past are smooth and so i <laughs> i think you can deduce that these lines will be smooth but actually one thing that i assume hasn't been considered in this graph might be the covid pandemic so maybe that would mean that the line isn't so smooth and actually there should be a little um a little drop um yeah that might be why the line isn't quite accurate yeah absolutely absolutely i think those are all really really good points to be thinking about um great thank you i'll leave it to one last question if i may i'm showing you here an artificial eye all right yeah and there's some research out there that they're beginning to basically construct a uh, visualization of through light of basically what your eye can see. So what they're trying to do is basically create an artificial eye to help those that are blind that potentially don't have an eye or don't have a functioning eye to be able to see. Okay. So what do you think could happen for an artificial eye to work? So just looking at this diagram, yeah, I mean, it looks a lot like an eye. So you have that sort of presumably metal shell with a hole in it, which uh, mimics where the pupil would be. And then there's a lens presumably made out of glass, which would focus the light uh, just like the lens in your in your eye does. I'm assuming that all of those little dots, which are then expanded next to it, are sort of light detectors. Um, I've not come across light detectors, but I'm sure, yeah, yeah, they must exist. So, yeah, if each of those little uh, dots is a light detector, then the light is focused through the lens onto, onto those detectors, which would detect uh, different intensities and different wavelengths of light i'm not sure can detectors detect different wavelengths of light because you'd need that for to detect different colors wouldn't you yeah let's start at the basic thing let's just keep it simple for now let's just say we're going to try and create a black and white or black white and gray sort of light so no color vision because that's quite complicated if you yeah. just think about it in terms of black and white how could it work in terms of black and white yeah so basically the detectors would need to detect different intensities of light because bright light is more intense and when it's dark you have very low intensities of light so that would um effectively that light would be converted into an electrical current which would then be sent through wires into what would be the optical nerve and then sent to and then sent into the brain um but yeah that would be tricky because the, the wires would have to effectively mimic the optic nerve and join the brain in the right places to um to form an image if you like and how would that work so okay so in terms of light you can imagine it. okay you know you as you say you could have some sort of artificial lens whether made of glass or some sort of other material that can then concentrate light on the back of these receptors these light receptors and yeah. as you say they could have they could be um photovoltaic receptors where they can change resistance say uh, depending on the amount of light intensity that you get depending on the amount of light excitation there um but how does it go from okay beep, 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 detecting light to all of a sudden sending in an impulse that's a big step there so what could be happening in between them i mean sorry could you could you repeat the question yeah so how can how can it go from those photoreceptors so light receptors in this artificial eye mm. how could that then transmit an impulse to the brain? How could that happen? I didn't do physics, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, the light would the light would impact this um, 
this detector and depending on the different intensity it would generate uh, a, a potential difference or a current which is proportional to that i'm not sure i'm not sure how that would work to be honest but you'd have yeah the light the light would hit something which would um automatically convert that energy if you like into electrical energy in in proportion to uh the intensity of the light and then what happens that's in a wire well then the wire would conduct that um potential difference through uh well into the optic nerve which then links it into the brain the impulse would have to mimic an impulse that's produced by an actual uh receptor in a human eye in order for the brain to be able to interpret that in the same way so yeah yeah effectively you'd have to send an impulse that um that mimics an impulse that would be sent through a neuron into the brain by uh, a rod or cone cell in an actual human eye and how does how could you match up the wire to the nerve yeah that's a good point um you might have to use some sorts of artificial synapse i'm not sure if these exist but effectively you need to produce an action potential in the in the neuron and so to do that i think that you could probably just if the if the wire and the neuron were in contact um then that potential difference would cause the voltage dependent sodium channels in that neuron to open and then an action potential would be generated so could you not just put the two in contact just just whack them on together, together. and it was just like <laughs> yeah what was the issue what what is there to think about because if you think about light if you think about your vision as well all the different little receptors if we don't exactly have this but if you were essentially to think about it in terms of different pixels how on earth could you map out all those different pixels and then have the right innovation to the right areas how would you go about that you'd have to know in an actual human eye again um which which neurons go from which part of uh from which part of the eye uh into into the optic nerve and where they are so you'd have to match yeah you'd have to effectively you'd have to know which which rods and cones connect to which neurons and where they feed through the optic nerve into the brain and then match that with the uh with the wires in the artificial one and how would you do that i'm not sure if this is i'm not sure if that would be the same for every person um or if that or if that varies between people as to where um where those neurons are in the optic nerve but presumably if we were assuming that neurons in general uh do align to the same places for everyone then you could use a microscope i'm not sure how many cells there are it would be an awful lot um but you could maybe use a microscope and and just look and see if you were to take for example uh, a dead person's donated eye and look at it interesting awesome and I think my honest answer to that answer is I don't know. I don't know how you do that. I don't think it's very difficult to know. And that's what they're trying to do at the moment. But it's very difficult to actually create an artificial eye um, as well to any pixelation resolution, let alone to have the same. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there's not anything at the moment that can have anywhere near the same resolution as, say, your iPhone, let alone like your human eye as well. Yeah. Really well done. We'll leave it there then. Um, so you're off the hot seat. Um, and now we'll just take sort of general reflection um how do you think that went yeah i think that went okay it, it kind of reminded me of my oxford interview to be honest um that i had a few good trains of thought but i also had lots of things where i didn't really know and i just had to sort of float some ideas and try and talk them through so yeah it was pretty much pretty much how my how my other one went i think yeah i think you did really well because ultimately you just verbalized your thoughts you just you know it wasn't an, a conversation that we were having between each other it was a to and fro and also you were just speaking out loud in terms of what you were thinking and that meant that it was quite easy to then follow your thoughts you went step by step and that was really really good so i could see how you think whether you were thinking chronologically whether you were thinking about environment versus behavior, whether you were thinking about something from an economic argument, from a moral argument, whether you were thinking about it in terms of sensitivity, specificity. So you outlined your arguments, your way of thinking as well. And that made it quite easy to follow and easy to guide as well, because, you know, we all make mistakes during our Oxbridge interviews. That's fine. And they're not looking to look at what you know. You didn't know what dialysis meant, sensitivity, specificity, but that's fine because we then guided you through what those meant. And then I was able to teach you new information and then you were able to apply that information. And that's what it's all about then. 
Um, so it's really good. Awesome. Anything to finish off that you want to mention, Will? I think that the main thing, like you said, is, in my opinion, just to voice your thoughts, try and stay calm and confident and know that if you have to say, I don't know, or I'm not sure, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. So thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. We hope you found it useful. If you have, please do drop a like and don't forget to subscribe as well. And be sure also to check out our website. We've got loads of free MMIs that you can have a look at that go through medical ethics, COVID-19, professionalism. We also have two Oxbridge tutorials, mock interviews that you can check out on there as well. All right, guys, thanks so much. See you later.